worship in song and Brother Chad as he breaks unto us the bread of life. Father, we're mindful of those that may be away from us today or tonight for whatever reason. We ask that you give them a safe journey back to us for those that are traveling. Father, we're mindful of several that are infirmed, for those that are shut in also, and for those that may be discouraged for whatever reason. May they know that they can cast their cares upon thee, and may they know that we stand ready to help them in any way. And may we be mindful of these things and these opportunities and take advantage of them to help those folks, to let them know that we're all on the same team, that we're part of thy body, that we strive to help one another. Father, we pray that every activity that this congregation has planned for the rest of this month and for the rest of this year and on the future life you see best for us will be successful and that many people will participate therein. Father, we ask that you continue to watch over and care for us. Forgive us when we fail thee. May we strive to be good examples to those round about us every day of the week. Continue to watch over us. This is our humble prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Next hymn is 249. Tell me the story of Jesus. I guess we should stand the tradition and stand up. <laughs> 249. Tell me the story of Jesus. And then after this hymn, Chad will come and speak to us. <clears throat> Tell me the story of Jesus.
invitation hymn this evening will be number 514, 514. We studied, I believe it was two Sundays ago, from the Sermon on the Mount and noticed some things that Jesus taught about fasting, noting that, you know, it's, you, can't, you can't overlook the fasting as it's discussed there, but at the same time understanding that Jesus is, is talking as much or more so about motives, why, why we're doing what we're doing and, and things of that nature. Uh, a lot of, lot of good comments on the fasting aspect of that. And so uh, I, t I mentioned that at some point I want to come back and uh, unpack that a little further and look at, look at some other things pertinent to that. However, we have a fellowship meal tonight. And that just didn't seem right. <laughs> I, was, I was thinking about that and I thought I, I, want to, uh, I want to do that at some point. But I also was thinking about a, a sermon uh, back this past summer. I had the opportunity to go to the Woodstock congregation, and uh, as, as is often the case with a summer series, uh, they told me they had a, a sermon that they wanted me to talk about, and they said, I want you to talk about Christian fellowship, uh, and, and talk about the fellowship that we have with God and with one another, and so I, I began thinking about that, and I, I thought, I don't really know how I want to approach this. It was, you know, some topics are so uh, confined, you, you, you say, I don't really know what what on earth I'm going to say about that? And then some topics are so broad that you say, how am I going to... Well, this was a broad topic, and there's a lot you can say about fellowship. But I ran across kind of a skeleton-type outline that gave me an idea from Hebrews 10, verses 19 to 25. And I looked at this fellow's points and began to develop it a little further. And, you know, Hebrews 10 is not a place I have ever gone before and preached a sermon on fellowship, but there are actually some interesting things that we can learn from that text on fellowship. A lot of times we go here and we talk about uh, maybe attendance or uh, maybe even exhorting one another, provoking one another to love and to good works, and certainly those things are all pertinent. But uh, there's a lot here about fellowship. Uh, fellowship is often misunderstood. Uh, I, I've, I've often jokingly said to people, when I say fellowship, what's the first thing that comes to mind? And nine times out of ten, it's eating. That's what we think about. Uh, we, we think fellowship meal, we think about potlucks, and that, I'm not, not, nothing wrong with that in and of itself, but there's more to it than that. I think we understand that. It's more than just potlucks and, and handshakes. Uh, there's a lot more involved in fellowship. It involves relationship. Uh, it involves salvation. Uh, when we're talking about it on a spiritual level, at least. Now, there's fellowship that we can have uh, with coworkers and things of that, but when it comes to spiritual fellowship, uh, there is a relationship that is involved. One of the greatest blessings uh, for, for me and for my family is the relationship we have with the congregation here. Uh, it's a wonderful thing. And so there, there's fellowship that we have because of that relationship. But it also involves, spiritually speaking, it also involves salvation. First John 1, 3, John says, That which we have heard from the beginning, uh, or that which we have seen and, and heard, declare we unto you, that you may have fellowship with us, he says. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. Uh, I ran across an, an interesting uh, illustration, an interesting story that I think illustrates a, a pretty good idea of the concept of spiritual fellowship as the Bible gives it to us. I talked about a young woman who in the fall of the year, she was traveling alone up a rutted, rugged highway that goes from Alberta to the Yukon. <clears throat> she didn't know that she didn't travel this road alone in a rundown Honda Civic. So she set off where only four-wheel drives normally venture. First evening, she found a room in the mountains near a summit, and she asked for a 5 a.m. wake-up call so she could get an early start. She couldn't understand why the clerk looked surprised at that request, but as she awoke to early morning fog shrouding the mountaintops, she began to understand. Not wanting to look foolish, she got up and went to breakfast. Two big, burly truckers were sitting there and invited Linda to join them. Since the place was so small, she felt obliged to go over there and join them for breakfast. Finally, one of the truckers, in making small talk, says, where are you headed? She says, White Horse. And the fellow says, in that little Civic? No way. That pass is dangerous in weather like this. Well, 
she was gutsy, if not very well informed. And she said, well, I'm determined to try. And the fellow said, well, I guess we're going to have to hug you. And she began to be upset, understandably. And she said, there's no way I'm going to let you touch me. And the fellow laughed and he said, not like that, lady. We'll put one truck in front of you, one truck behind you. And in that way, we'll get you through the mountains. All that foggy morning, Linda followed the two red dots in front of her and had the reassurance of a big escort behind as they made their way safely through the mountains. Isn't that a good illustration of fellowship? We have others, sometimes those who are strong, mature in the faith, and like Paul said, 1 Corinthians 11, 1, follow me as I also follow Christ, be ye followers of me even as I also am of Christ. And then sometimes we are able to follow them as they follow the Lord. And then sometimes we're the stronger ones and maybe we're helping to encourage somebody who needs that little push from behind. That, that's fellowship, though. It's the idea that sometimes I may be the person who's in need of that encouragement and I need to, to get in there and maybe have somebody encouraging from behind and looking ahead to follow that example of someone as they follow the Lord. Sometimes I may be one who says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of forge the way I'm going to lead. You can follow me as I follow Christ. Sometimes I'm behind helping to nudge somebody along. That's a great, great earthly illustration of fellowship. As we go to Hebrews chapter 10, there's a lot, there's a lot here said here about fellowship. Now, this fellow pointed out, I thought this was really interesting, uh, he, he centered this around faith, hope, and love. And so, like I said, I kind of developed the points, but, uh, but I, I really uh, got the main, main gist of it from this other fellow, and I thought it was a very interesting play on words, faith, hope, and love from Hebrews chapter 10. Again, a passage that we wouldn't often go to and say, oh, here's a, here's a great lesson on fellowship. But he, he mentions, first of all, there's a call to enter in faith. Go to Hebrews chapter 10 with me, and let's, let's begin at verse 19. And notice what he says here, 19 to 22. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. And having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Notice what he, he points out here. We can enter into God's presence. That's, that's, the, that's the whole, I guess, the basic form of fellowship is having the ability to have a relationship with God. Sin separates. We know that from Isaiah 59, 1 and 2 and, and other passages as well, but sin will separate us from God. And so to have fellowship with God is the most basic desire, at least it ought to be. And so we can enter into God's presence, and he points that out, but, but there are several things that make that possible. First, in verse 19, he talks about the shedding of Jesus' blood makes that possible. Having, therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus gives us access to the holiest. In the Old Testament, we don't have time to get into it in depth, but there were many restrictions for coming into the presence of God. Sometimes you read the Old Testament, and if you've, if you've been doing the daily Bible reading that we've talked about a lot in the last few weeks, uh, you, you're probably getting around, um, well, let's see, I'm still, I'm still in Genesis, so you're probably getting into Exodus. If you're not there, you'll get to it, unless you, maybe some of you have read ahead, but you'll be getting to it shortly, where you read a lot of specific instructions that God's going to give Israel for coming into his presence. And sometimes when we read that, we may be tempted to think, why? Why is he doing that? Is he just trying to be tedious? Is he trying to be difficult? And the answer is, of course, the old law is written for our learning, Romans 15, 4. It's a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, and it's teaching us, number one, it helps us to understand how much better things are under the new covenant. And that's, of course, the key word of the book of Hebrews that we're studying out of tonight. But it's also to show us that it's no joke to come into God's presence. It is very serious. And it ought to be approached with extreme reverence. And so there were a lot of restrictions. Only the high priest could enter into the most holy place. Only certain ones could go into the holy place. But only the high priest could enter into what we would call the most holy place. And even the high priest could enter in once each year on the Day of Atonement. That's it. And if he tried to go in there on a different day, well, he would die. 
So we see what a serious matter it is to come into the presence of God. Certain conditions, certain items had to be met. And yet, here we are today, living under the New Testament. If I'm a child of God, I can walk right into the presence of God, as it were. And I can have an audience with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. You think about that. That's amazing. And so we can enter into his presence because of the blood of Jesus. <clears throat> can you imagine... I'm just going to be honest, not that I'd want to do this, but if you decided, I just want to go sit down and talk to the president, I, I want to go and just, just go visit him. And if I want to go visit Brother Bob, Brother Chris, or somebody, I'd, I'd just get in my car and drive over there, and you know, especially if I know he's home, I'd just walk right in. Doesn't work that way if you want to go visit the president, though, does it? You're going to have, you're going to have a seriously difficult time. And you're not even going to get considered without an appointment unless you were some kind of a world leader or something. And even then, there's going to be constant care, exercise, and it, it just all kind of hoops that you're going to have to go through. And yet, you know, we've heard many illustrations, and I've heard several, especially when, when Abraham Lincoln was president and uh, he had sons. And You know what the sons did? They didn't have an appointment with Mr. President. They didn't have to go through a lot of hoops. In fact, one of Abraham Lincoln's sons, well, I can't remember which one it was, but he was kind of notorious. He was a little bit rambunctious. And he was kind of notorious. He would sometimes just burst right into a cabinet meeting and go see Dad. Because it wasn't Mr. President. It was his father. And you see, when we're ch children of God, we don't have to meet certain, we don't have to, you know, one, only one day out of the year and, and there's all these things that have to happen. If you are covered by the blood of Christ and you're his child, then he says, you can come into my presence. We can enter into his presence because of the shedding of Jesus' blood. Those who are cleansed by the blood of Jesus have freedom to enter into God's presence continually. 1 John 2, 1, that's what he says, my, my little children, these things write unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And you've heard other people say before that the word advocate there could literally be translated lawyer. It's the idea of you have a lawyer. And he's, he's, you know, we sometimes use the expression, he's a lawyer who's never lost a case. And he's advocating for you before the throne of God if you're a child of God. Continual. Hebrews 7.25 comes to mind as well where it says, in fact, you can, you can flip back just a page. It is in my Bible. Wherefore he is able, talking about Jesus, he is able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Jesus Christ is never going to have his office expire, never going to say, well, you know, I've reached my term limit. You're, you're going to need another advocate at this point. He's never going to say, well, I, I can't afford to do this anymore. He ever lives to make intercession for God's children. What a wonderful thought that is that I can enter in continually. There's one God and one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus, 1 Timothy 2.5. I was talking to somebody recently and said, well, what, what's the question? Because we talked last week about the Holy Spirit and how he intercedes for us. But what, what's the difference in an intercessor and a mediator? Uh, they, they both act on your behalf. If you have an intercessor, if you have a mediator, but the, the key, the chief difference is as a mediator, Jesus is mediator and intercessor. The Holy Spirit can only be intercessor because the Holy Spirit has never been human. The mediator knows intimately both sides. And so there might be, a, there might be someone in a sport. And so there's going to be someone who has to intercede on behalf of this athlete to the administration of the club. Might be somebody who could intercede but not mediate because maybe he's never been in administration before. But maybe there's someone who's played the sport and he's been in the administration and you see he knows both sides. That's the chief difference. Jesus is our mediator. There's only one in all of time, in all of eternity, one mediator between God and man, and that's the man, Christ Jesus. And it's because of his blood that we can enter into the presence of God continually but also with, with confidence. Hebrews 4, 16, what, what does he say there? Ending that chapter, he says, let, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. I can come continually into God's presence. 
I can come confidently into God's presence. And that's not to say I come, come into God's presence with pride. And we, we understand that you must come before God's presence with humility. And yet at the same time, it's just like you going back to the illustration with Abraham Lincoln's son. He doesn't timidly come in and say, uh, uh, Mr. President, uh, I hope I'm not interrupting anything. Uh, may I please have a, just a moment? May I have a word? That's his son. He comes in head held high. And he says, I need to talk to you, Father. And you and I as Christians, if we are Christians, we can come before the throne of God continually and with confidence, knowing that we're his children. But notice something else. Turn over to, again, it's just one page back in my Bible, Hebrews chapter 9, before, before I move on from here. <clears throat> chapter 9, verse, let's just begin at verse 7. This idea of entering into God's presence because of the shedding of Jesus' blood. And really, we could, we could spend our entire time just on this sub-point. But, but he's talking about this, and, and he says, into the second, talking about the most holy place, went the high priest alone once every year, and we talked about that, not without blood. He had to go in to offer blood, which he offered for himself and for the heirs of the people. The Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing, which was a figure, we might say a shadow or a type, for the time then present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience, which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. But Christ, being come and high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once. And that could literally be translated, and I believe some versions actually have it translated, once for all. He entered in once for all into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. In other words, it's not a yearly thing. Jesus is not going in each year into heaven to offer a sacrifice. His blood was sufficient once for all time. Let that sink in. For if the blood of bulls and of goats, verse 13, and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on the unclean, sanctified to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. For this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death for the redemption of transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called would, might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Drop down to verse 22. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. That's your key word in Hebrews over and over again. It's a better covenant, better sacrifice, better offering, the blood of Jesus that we're talking about now. And then verse 24, For Christ has not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures or shadows of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Don't lose those last two words there. Five letters, two words, underline them because he is appearing in the presence of God. If you are a child of God, he's appearing in the presence of God for you. What a thought that we can enter into God's presence because of the blood of Jesus Christ. But not only that, we can enter into the presence of God because of the sacrifice of Jesus' body. It's a bodily sacrifice. Getting back to Hebrews chapter 10, Verse 20, notice what it says, By a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. At the death of Jesus, if you read in Matthew, and I believe there are other gospel accounts that record this as well, and I remember specifically reading in Matthew, the, the veil of the temple, it tore. In fact, it tore from the top to the bottom, signifying this is God doing this. What does that mean? The way into the most holy place is now open. Jesus has opened up that way through the sacrifice of his body. It had to be a bodily sacrifice. And, you know, we partake of the Lord's Supper and we remember, we memorialize the body, the blood of Jesus that he gave so willingly for us that we might have the hope of heaven, that we might be able to enter into God's presence in fellowship with him. 
You know what it's like when you're at odds with somebody. Hopefully, unless, unless we have some kind of a personality where we just enjoy conflict, we don't like being at odds with folks. But if there's ever someone you don't want to be at odds with, it is God Almighty. And because of the blood and the body of Jesus, we can enter into God's presence and have fellowship restored with him. And then, of course, we can enter into God's presence, verse 21, because of the supplying of Jesus' blessing. Look at verse 21. Having an high priest over the house of God. Well, if we are members of the body of Christ, we are the household of God or the house of God. 1 Timothy 3.15. Paul says, If I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the church of God, which is the house of God, the pillar and ground of the truth. He's not saying don't run in the church building. Disclaimer, I'm not saying run in the church building. <laughs> but he's not saying... Hey, watch what you do when you're, you know, sometimes people will talk about this, this room here and call it the sanctuary or something like that. This room is not, and I'm not saying we ought to disrespect it, but understand that this brick and wood and mortar and things like that, this isn't, there's nothing holy about this structure. What is holy is God's people as they emulate him. As we imitate Christ, we are, that's what Peter says, be ye holy that's the command of God, be ye holy for I am holy. And so there's, there's nothing inherently sanctified or, or holy about this building itself. The house of God is the church. So when it says there that we have a high priest over the house of God, that's Jesus. And he gives his blessing to those who are in Christ. He made a way for us to enter into the holiest the, most, the true most holy place, heaven, into the very presence of God. And, and only when we come into God's presence, can, or only, only when we're in fellowship with God, can we come into his presence. How are we in fellowship with God? Well, that gets back to the blood. You've got to be covered by the blood. And, and so, as I said, we, we literally could spend our entire sermon talking about the blood because there is no fellowship. It's not even possible without the blood and the body of Jesus Christ. And so that's why we often talk about the plan of salvation and extending heaven's invitation at the end of a sermon. It's because sometimes people don't even see it. The need, the extreme need to be covered by the blood, to be in fellowship with God. And so that's why we encourage folks to believe in Jesus as the Savior, to give your life over to him in repentance and, and to confess his name as Lord. Be immersed in water. To have your sins washed away. He washed us from our sins in his own blood, Revelation 1.5 tells us. Acts 22.16, Paul, uh, of course at that time Saul of Tarsus, he's told by Ananias, arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. We've often pointed out things equal to the same thing or equal to each other. And so to be baptized into Christ, to have your sins washed away, is to come into contact with the blood of Christ that washes away sins. That's how we contact the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb. So Jesus' blood and his body allow us to enter into God's presence with his blessing. And when you've got the blessing of Jesus Christ, God has given all glory, all power and authority to him on heaven, in heaven and on earth, Matthew 28, 18. When you have Jesus' blessing, you have the Father's blessing. And so we can enter into the presence of God Almighty. Not only that, though, we not only just have the ability to enter into God's presence because of the body and the blood of Jesus and having his blessing, we can enter into God's presence in faith. Faith is a substance of thing, evidence of things uh, hoped for. I'm just going blank. Hebrews 11 verse 1. The substance of things hoped for. Sometimes you get something in your head and you can't get it right. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. That's what faith is. And without faith, it's impossible to please him. He that cometh to God must believe that he is, and he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 and 6. So we can enter into God's presence in faith, having fellowship with him. Not only that, forgiveness. Hebrews 8, 8 through 11, we won't go and read all those verses, but he basically says there, he sums it all up by saying, going back to the prophecy of Jeremiah 31, their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. God says they're forgotten. When God washes away our sins, they're gone. Th this used to disturb me as a child, uh, even on into young adulthood, because I knew I'd made mistakes, just, just as much as anybody else. But uh, 
it, you know, it really bothered me to think of some of the things I'd done, disobedience to my parents and, and, and all kind of things that I knew were going to cost me my soul. And sometimes a preacher would stand up, whether a local preacher or a guest preacher, and he'd talk about verses like Ecclesiastes 12, 13 and 14, where uh, the conclusion of the matter, fear God and keep his commandments, this is the whole of man. For God shall bring everything, every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or evil. And that, that just, that would terrify me. And I would think, well, you know, I'm, I've, I've even made things right, and, and now all these things are going to be brought into judgment, and that, that, that's bad news. And so I, the more I began to study that and understand the biblical position on that, the more comfort it brought me, because what God wants us to understand, and, and it wasn't, I don't think it was like the, the, those preachers, I think it was more like my lack of understanding, but what I began to understand is, when I make something right with the Lord, when I come to him on his terms, and, and maybe obeying the gospel to become a Christian, turning, again, you know, faith, repentance, confession, and being immersed into Christ, or, or whether it be as a child of God who's gone astray, and I come to him and, and repentance and prayer, make that right, and, and when the blood of Jesus Christ takes away sin, it's gone. It is absolutely gone. It's forgotten. And so I don't have to constantly live in fear. It's, it's not a license to go back. It's not a license just to continue in any kind of sin and say, well, oh, well, the, the blood of Jesus Christ is going to take care of that. It's not. If I, get to, if I get lazy and lackadaisical with my faith, it's not. But God wants you to understand you don't have to live in constant fear of the day of judgment if you're in Christ, covered by his blood. In fact, the faithful child of God ought to very much look forward to the day of judgment because that's the day he hears, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of thy Lord. I don't have to be afraid of that. I can look forward to it. And we often talk about 1 John 1, 7. If, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship, and that's what we're talking about here tonight. One with another, in the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Fellowship with one another, but most importantly with God. So we can enter in faith and forgiveness and, of course, in fellowship. When we're cleansed by the blood of Jesus, we're priests. This is verse 22. Let us draw near with a, with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Well, he talks about full assurance of faith. We mentioned that. Our bodies washed, hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. So that's the idea of forgiveness. And then there's, there's fellowship here. We have full assurance. We're drawing near to God with a true heart and full assurance because we are in fellowship with him. And again, we noticed earlier, 1 John 1, 3, where he says that you might have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. It's interesting, the call to enter in faith. We, are, we can enter into God's presence because of Jesus. But let's notice the hope aspect of this. There's, there's a call to endure in hope. We can, we can endure, first of all, because of God's future for us. Look at verse 23. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. God has a future for us. Titus talks about this, Titus, or Paul writing to Titus, Titus 1, 2. He says, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. God has promised eternal life to his faithful children. And he cannot lie. It's not even in his nature to tell a lie. And so we can endure in hope knowing God's future for me. If I'm his child, I have the hope of eternal life with Jesus Christ, the Father, the Holy Spirit, and all the faithful through all the ages. I know that's going to happen because God's faithful. And that's the next thing we can endure because of God's faithfulness. Look at the last part of verse 23. For he is faithful that promised. 2 Timothy 2.13 Paul says, if we believe not, yet he, God, abideth faithful. He cannot deny himself. What that basically is saying is, even if we become unfaithful, it's not going to change the nature of God. He is faithful. And it's not to say that, that I can't turn my back on him and walk away, but it, what it is saying is, men out here in the world, they can deny God all day long. But it's not going to change the fact. God is faithful. He's going to do what he says he's going to do. And for his faithful children, it means he's going to give us a home in heaven when this life is over. And so we see a call to endure in, in hope. 
because we have hope of eternal life. We, we throw that word hope out, and we, we use it very loosely. You know, somebody might say, I, I hope to win a million dollars, or I hope to have a, a, you know, so, so much, make so many dollars one day before I die, or I hope to get a new car. Sometimes a young person, maybe they're uh, getting toward the age of driving, they say, I hope I get a car. They may not really expect it. But biblically, biblically, hope is w desire, wanting something, Plus, it's always coupled with expectation. And so when the Bible talks about the hope of eternal life, it always means obviously something that we desire, but it means something that I fully expect I will receive. Why? Because God is faithful. And so there's a call to endure in hope. And then finally, notice there's a call to exhort in love. Faith, hope, and then love. There's a call to exhort one another in love. Verses 24 and 25, notice what he says. These are more familiar to us. Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. We can exhort one another in love. How, how do we do that? Well, we can stir one another up personally. He talks about provoking one another. That's the idea, stir each other up to love and to good works. We can stir one another up by our words. Ephesians 4.29 says, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, building up, that it may minister grace to the hearer. Oh, how we need to hear that, don't we? Sometimes we're on our children, and sometimes we'll even say, if you can't say anything nice, don't say anything at all. Sometimes we need to follow that advice. We need to make sure we're exhorting one another, stirring one another up personally, by our words, encouraging each other. Colossians 4, 6 says, Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. Through our words, we can stir one another up personally, but also through our works. Galatians 6, 10, we know what Paul said. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto those who are of the household of faith. Do good unto all, and especially to our brothers and sisters in Christ. Stirring one another up by doing good works to help one another in whatever way that we can. But not only that, we can celebrate with one another publicly. Well, what do we mean by that? There's, there's a number of ways that we can talk about this, and this is where really kind of more person, practical application of fellowship. There's the aspect of worship. We, can, we understand worship is a solemn occasion, and it's got to be done decently in order, in, and in order. 1 Corinthians 14, 40, and other passages teach us that. And yet, let us never forget that worship ought to be a joyous occasion. I, I'm, I'm convinced that too many people, they don't ever experience the joy of worship. It is an obligation. It is something that is tiresome. And we've talked about this before in, in other sermons. Sometimes people come with an empty bucket, so to speak. And they, they're, they're holding it out, as it were, saying, you fill up my bucket. When what we ought to be doing is coming with a full bucket to offer to God. And God, just because of his very nature and who he is, when we do that, you pour out, you empty that bucket of praise and worship to God, what you'll find when you leave is probably going to be more full than it was when you came. That's just the nature of the God we serve. But what a joy to come together. Now, I'm going to tell you something. If we were out of town today, we'd have still assembled with the saints somewhere, and we'd have worshiped. If we'd been in Tennessee, if we'd have been in Texas, if we'd have been overseas somewhere, we'd have found a congregation of God's people with whom to assemble. If we couldn't find one, we'd, as a family, we'd have a worship and, and have communion and so on and so forth. That's, just, that's, that's what you do on the Lord's Day. Christians worship the Lord. But I'm going to tell you something. I don't mind telling you this. In fact, I'm glad to tell you. It wouldn't have been the same because this is home. And we have special fellowship with one another and so there's the call to exhort in love. There's a special relationship that we have with the folks here because this is home. And I used to work with the church in Chattanooga, and I used to work with the congregation in Childersburg, and I've worked at other places, and I love those people. But nobody is as special to us as our Bremen family, the family here. That's just that's the fellowship, the relationship that we have with the congregation here. And so we can celebrate publicly through our worship, but also by our warning. 
exhorting, encouraging, also includes warning. Sometimes folks need warning. Sometimes, you know, Paul says, Galatians 6, 1, if a, if a man be overtaken in a fault, you were spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Sometimes people get overtaken in a fault. In fact, sometimes we just kind of drift away. If you go back to Hebrews chapter 2, that's what he talks about at the beginning of the chapter. We ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip, is what the King James says. American Standard says, lest happily we drift away from them. You know, sometimes you just kind of drift away and you don't even realize it until you've drifted far off. You realize I've, I've gotten away from where I need to be. So it includes warning as well. Colossians 1.28, Paul talks about warning every man, preaching Christ and warning. That's, that's part of it. And sometimes people forget that aspect of fellowship. They say, hey, yo, don't you talk to me. Sometimes even people will say, don't judge me. But that's what fellowship is. There's relationship. And we help one another in every way that we can. Oh, it's wonderful when we have the opportunity to worship together, and that's, and that's part of it. And we can speak edifying words to one another and do good works for one another. But sometimes, any given one of us, sometimes we need the warning. We need the exhortation to get back on the right path. And so we can do that for one another. Jesus wants us to have fellowship with him and with the Father and with the Holy Spirit. And he wants us to have fellowship with one another. And he wants us to experience the joy of true Christian fellowship. We can enter in faith through the blood of Jesus Christ into the very presence of God. We can endure whatever life throws at us in hope of eternal life. And we can exhort one another in love to faithfulness. As we close our thoughts, I want to I wanna share something with you that I ran across. Uh, most people are familiar with the, uh, the little cartoon, Peanuts. And uh, I always enjoyed reading that cartoon when I was a kid. And back when they, you, you get to Sunday morning cartoons in the paper. But it, the, the illustration says that hope motivates us to keep going and not give up. And, and without hope, we don't, we don't want to do anything. But this Peanuts cartoon had Lucy and Linus. They're sitting in front of the television set. And Lucy says to Linus, go get me a glass of water. Linus looks surprised and he says, why should I do anything for you? You never do anything for me. Lucy says, on your 75th birthday, I'll bake you a cake. Linus gets up and heads to the kitchen and he says, life's just more pleasant when you have something to look forward to. <laughs> you know, as, as Christians, life is more pleasant because we have something to look forward to. I want to serve the Lord and do everything I can to help the Lord and his cause when I'm on this earth. But life's just more pleasant because the fellowship I have with the brethren here, but most importantly, the fellowship I have with the Lord. And I have something to look forward to. Whether I live just a few more days or weeks or months, or whether I live a good long while after this, I've got something to look forward to. Not because I'm so good, but because I'm in Christ Jesus. Life's just better when you've got something to look forward to. Think about it tonight as we eat our fellowship meal, and it's a wonderful blessing to celebrate people who have come and placed membership, new members and things like that. And it's a wonderful occasion, and we'll enjoy some good food. But think about the fellowship we have in Christ. And make sure you thank the Lord when you pull your head tonight if you're in Christ for that fellowship. If you're not, that's why I'm going to extend heaven's invitation now. Maybe you need to come and obey the gospel and become a Christian. Maybe you need to get your life right with the Lord. You can enjoy the best fellowship meal of your life. Get your life right tonight. Do it now while we stand and sing.
We thank all those that had a public part in our worship today. Brother Steve leading our auditorium class did an excellent job. Brother Chad for his lessons. Johnny leading our singing this morning. All those that met around the table this morning. Brother Jimmy leading our singing tonight. We're thankful for all of your efforts. For those that are visiting with us, your honored guests, we're so glad that each of you decided to be here with us tonight. Maybe you heard that we were having a potluck dinner tonight, and if you came and didn't know that, well, you're welcome to stay. We'll have plenty of groceries, and we'll meet convene in the fellowship hall here immediately after services tonight. We're having our newcomer recognition dinner, so we're looking forward to that immediately after our evening services tonight. So for those that are visiting with us, you're welcome to stay, and we look forward to welcoming you there. I'll remind you of those that we mentioned this morning. Wayne Spake, brother of our James Spake, has been moved and continues in room 240 at Higgins Hospital here in Bremen. will be there for a rehabilitation assignment for some time. Kelly Pitsley's mother has gone home and she's doing better. Is that right? I think so. Where are you, Kelly? There you are. She's doing good. Okay, good. Rhonda Patterson has uh, treatments that are beginning this coming Wednesday. She will have daily treatments for six weeks. So certainly we should remember Sister Rhonda and her family at this time. We extend our sympathy to Ken Glover. We mentioned this uh, last Wednesday, but uh, Ken Glover's brother, Jerry Glover, passed away, and the services and the funeral for Mr. Glover were um, last week. Shirley Smallwood's brother, Buell White, is not doing well, she reports. He's in hospice care in the Atlanta area. However, Richard and Shirley report the birth of a great-grandson born to their granddaughter, Allison. Harris Stephen Carter was born last week, seven pounds. Mother and baby are doing fine. She also tells me that their other granddaughter is expecting just any time now, so hopefully within another couple of weeks, she'll have the birth of another great-grandchild. We also offer our congratulations to Brother Mark Clark and his inclusion in the Georgia Dugout Hall of Fame yesterday. So we're certainly proud of Brother Clark and all of his accomplishments in his career. Are there others that we should mention? Okay, other events. There's a Youth Devo next Sunday evening, the 25th, yeah, next Sunday, at the home of Eric and Mary Blank. That'll be a Youth Devo next Sunday after the evening service at the home of the Blanks. Our area-wide singing is quickly approaching. That will be Friday week. That will be the 30th of January. We're looking forward to that event. That will be Friday, January 3rd, beginning at 7 o'clock. It will be the first area-wide singing of the year. It's usually very well attended. A lot of folks are looking forward to that since we've not had opportunity to convene for the last two months. So we're looking forward to that event, asking each of you to come and participate, but also bring plenty of finger foods after that so that we can host our guests for that event. Friday, January 30, first area-wide singing here at Bremen. Group one, Robert and Cheryl's group, meets this coming Saturday, January 24, 5 p.m. at the home of Stephen and Lee Cooper. Finger foods and soups are the fair, drinks and desserts will be provided. Several other events that are upcoming. West Georgia will have a youth rally this coming weekend, beginning January 23rd through the 25th. Ron Nation, the speaker. The Bible Lectureship at the Terra Congregation will also be this coming weekend. That's in Jonesboro, Georgia, January 24th and 25th. Chad will be speaking on that Saturday. The Bowden Winter Lectureship will be upcoming the first weekend of February, February 6th through 8th. There's more information about that on the uh, bulletin board here in the hallway. And the Brethren at Ironiton will have their lectureship upcoming uh, the last weekend of this month, January 30 through February 1, the subject being repentance. Lord's Supper is kept prepared for those that wish to observe it. Once we stand to, thing, stand to sing in just a moment, go through this door, second door on the left, and there will be someone there waiting to serve you. Again, I'll remind you of our fellowship meal after the evening service here in just a few moments, and our next opportunity to convene with the saints will be Wednesday for a midweek Bible study at 7 o'clock. Should we mention anything else? Final song, brother. 276. 276. We'll work till Jesus comes. If you'll stand, we'll sing and be dismissed. First and last stanza. Oh, Latin. 
Father in heaven, we are thankful that you've given us the measure of health that you have that allows us to be here this evening. We're thankful for the preparation of all of our teachers this day. We're thankful for the auditorium class of Brother Steve and as he taught on repentance. Father, help us to realize the importance of that and the daily efforts that are required to fulfill that command. Father, we're thankful for Chad's lesson this morning on having our hearts right as it comes to laying up treasures. Father, we're so blessed in this country. We have treasure that is just running over in comparison to the world. And Father, sometimes Sometimes we don't give thee the credit for how good you've given us this life. And then, Father, we are so thankful for fellowship, this lesson that we've just heard, and how richly we're blessed with this congregation, with so many talented individuals that we can encourage one another to be faithful and to be encouraged. Father, there are many that have prepared meals so that we may enjoy a fellowship meal together. We first of all would pray that you would bless their efforts, bless their hands as they have worked diligently to prepare this food for us. And then Father, bless us as we enjoy this meal together and may it be said at the end of this evening that it was good for us to be here, to be recharged so that tomorrow or even this very evening, we may seek out opportunities to do good in your kingdom. For this is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen.